Thank you for downloading from the BBC. For details of our complete range of podcasts and our terms of use, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts. So, up in the left to, what, 33? And then further? How high are we going? We go from here to 33 and then we change lifts and then we go to 68. BBC World Service, I'm Mike Williams with The Why Factor. Today we're heading up, building high. Why? Why do we construct skyscrapers? You keep smiling, are you happy with your building? I keep watching people smiling, so I smile. <laughs> I feel quite dizzy actually. I'm not very good with heights and suddenly <laughs> I feel very, very exposed at the top here. Though really I'm quite nervous about going to the edge. Oof. It's like flying here. It is a remarkable view from this height looking down on London. It looks like those toy trains far, far below. How, how far below us are they? Well, we are 300 metres up in the air here, so I mean, it's a 300 metres is quite a lot. It's like flying, but you don't move. I mean, you know, when, when you go by a helicopter, the helicopter moves, keep going. This is different. This is a piece of earth going up. I should get you to introduce yourself. Well, I'm Renzo Piano, uh, architect by, by destiny, I guess. <laughs> and um, you designed this, the Shard, the tallest building in London. You know, architecture is a choral job. You never do. It's like making a movie. You are working with many people. But and you are the director. Well, maybe, yes, yes. Let's put it that way. Why do you think humans want to go high? Why do they want to build tall buildings? Ah, that's a good question. I can find practical reasons, of course, many practical reasons. In the case like this, of course, you don't have land, but you still want to increase the density of the city. But then if you move to more spiritual argument, you know, building tall is a challenge in the sky. It's also defined the force of gravity. That I know that is a bad idea, but still, it makes sense. It's also a way to go up to breathe fresh air. There is always something interesting in the idea of going up. When we started, we decided the building to reach 400 meters. But then we can't because of the airplane routes and all that. So the reason why those shards are broken and they stay there is because they still desire to go up. But they will never, never go up. And this idea that the building is not finished, but is expressing this kind of desire to grow. It's part of the funny story. And now the music's come on. You can hear these angelic voices up on the viewing gallery. I wonder why that kind of music. I have no idea. I would much prefer Pink Floyd or maybe a Kid Jarrett or well, something doesn't, like doesn't that. doesn't quite imply reaching to the heavens, though, does it? Yeah, but this is not about paradise. This is about watching the earth. The building is a narrow pyramid which tapers towards a point, a point that it doesn't quite reach. Towards the top, the sides become irregular, just like shards of broken glass pointing towards the 400-metre mark that Renzo Piano had wanted to reach but wasn't allowed. The shard towers over South London, but globally it is way down the list of tall buildings. And for some, at least, height really does matter. There is something that has always made man want to reach up toward the heavens, whether it's a religious belief or an expression of political power or an expression of economic power. Daniel Safarik from the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, where they study the design, construction and operation of skyscrapers. I think you could go all the way back to the Tower of Babylon and we continue on to... Obviously, churches are a way to connect people to what was happening in the heavens and a way for the church to project its own power. And then we kind of get into the late 19th and early 20th centuries when what we think of as the modern skyscraper arose in cities like New York and Chicago, where now we're talking about economic power being projected mostly by corporations. And in the most recent iteration, we're now in a quasi-political and economic statement made on behalf of entire countries, not just companies. 
You keep using the word power. Yes. Why? Well, the, I, it's a nicer word than ego, I think. <laughs> It's official. New York's new World Trade Center beat out Chicago's Willis Tower for the tallest building in the U.S. We are number two. New York's one World Trade Center will usurp Chicago's Willis Tower as the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere when it's completed next year. A panel of architects ruled that the needle on the Manhattan skyscraper is part of the permanent structure rather than an antenna and can be included when determining the building's height. If it looks like an antenna, acts like an antenna, then guess what? It is an antenna. That's number one. Number two, I think at the Willis Tower, you will have a view that's unprecedented in its beauty and its landscape and its capacity to capture something, something you can't do from an antenna. The key word is permanence. This is a permanent feature. You might not like it, but the council is not here to give a subjective opinion. It's to measure height and give an objective opinion on the height of that spire. The two cities have fought continuously for supremacy in the skyline, and this continued with the debate over whether the spire of One World Trade Center should be counted. Blair came in, architecture critic of the Chicago Tribune, on the competition between Chicago and New York. That spire had been stripped of decorative elements. There were people in Chicago saying it shouldn't be counted as a spire, it should only be counted as a broadcast tower which wouldn't count in official height measurements. But the Chicago-based Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, which is the kind of arbiter of these disputes, ruled in favor of One World Trade Center. And they said that the mast should still count. You say the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat is Chicago-based. Do you think they may need to relocate now? (laughs) <laughs> no. People in Chicago are very secure about their architecture. They realize that being the tallest isn't what matters. It's being the best that matters. Building by building, it beats New York quite easily. So coming from the city with the second highest building in America, he says height doesn't matter. But Chicago does hold an unassailable record as the birthplace of the skyscraper. In the 1880s, Chicago had an economic boom, and there was a great demand for new office space, but there was nowhere to go but up. The Loop, uh, as the central area is known, is surrounded by an elevated railroad track, or in that that case, it wasn't elevated yet. It was just a railroad track. And there were other things that constricted growth outward. So instead, skyscrapers went upward. They were propelled by really a desire to make money, more so than in any ego statement. What enabled this was new technologies, particularly a steel frame that created kind of an internal network of support for the towers rather than the walls supporting them. The outer walls became a curtain of masonry and glass, and the inner walls were really what held up the skyscraper. A self-supporting masonry wall really reached its limits at about 16 stories. Chicago restricted the height of skyscrapers. It had invented them, but it was also somewhat horrified by them. And so New York had a very different attitude. It was a no-holds-bar attitude. And as a result, in the early years of the 20th century, Manhattan's height far outstripped Chicago's. One of the great Manhattan skyscrapers was the Woolworth Building, called the Cathedral of Commerce, and its architect was Cass Gilbert. Cass Gilbert said something wonderful about this very romantic-looking skyscraper. He said, a skyscraper is a machine that makes the land pay. And that really gets to the heart of these buildings. We tend to think of them as demonstrations of wealth, power, ego. But many of them are really there for very pragmatic reasons. They are there to make the land pay. They are real estate investments. I'm sure that is absolutely the case. But from the the very earliest constructions that we made, it seems that we went up. It's not just ego. It's partly an attempt to reach from the profane territory of the ground plane to the sacred realm of the sky. If you really want to see skyscrapers in the most idealistic light, it's a journey from the profane to the sacred. This is the dream of flying, I think. It's one of the funny idea why you want to make a tall building, you know. But you'll you'll know the myth of Icarus, who made wings out of wax and feathers and tried to fly to the sun and flew too high. The wax melted and he fell and died. That's what happens (laughs) when human hubris takes you too high. I know. 
That's why you have to be wise people. And that's why you, have, you need to be a good builder. And this is what I am. When it comes to towering skylines, America has lost its supremacy. These days, the tallest towers are rising elsewhere, in greatest numbers in China, but in terms of height, the Middle East is winning this strange battle, and the tallest man-made structure in the world is in Dubai. I think the Burj Khalifa isn't just yardstick tall, it's about being tall. The great Chicago architect Louis Sullivan talked about skyscrapers, saying that a skyscraper should be a proud and soaring thing. And I think the Burj Khalifa achieves that quite beautifully. Its setbacks, its sense of whirling, spiraling upward, really do make a very thin, elegant, light reflecting skyline statement. Many critics chastised the building, but they did so from afar. They called it a vanity building. They called it the Hummer of skyscrapers. <laughs> I was there. I saw it. I spent a week looking at it. It's a beautiful tower, and I think it's a real achievement, aesthetically as well as an engineering achievement. And will it be beaten in terms of its height, do you think? Oh, yes, it will be beaten. Adrian Smith, the chief design architect of the Burj Khalifa, has designed a kilometer-high tower called the Kingdom Tower in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. I believe it's scheduled to be finished in 2018 or 2019. It will top the Burj by a good 300 feet or so, roughly the length of an American football field. So the story continues of human ambition, one country, one city trying to outstrip the other. Yeah, this is part of the story, and it's not the best part. This is what they call rhetoric. The tall building as a symbol of power, the phallic symbol, is part of the story of the world. And this is the reason why people try to make a bit taller than the other one, a bit stronger. You know, architecture has been expressing symbolically a value all the time. But some of those values are real value. Some are not very interesting. When architecture start to celebrate money by making funny big buildings that express that kind of power, and then we become less interesting. Last year alone, there were 97 buildings completed at 200 metres or higher. It's an all-time record. And one thing leaps out when you look at the figures. Most of these new skyscrapers are in China. The data come from the Council on Tall Buildings. Here's Daniel Sefaric again. In China, the government is very heavily involved. They directly invest in the construction and design of these buildings. The way it sort of works in the capitalist model is that, okay, I've got an economic enterprise, I'm running out of space, I need to maximize that space, therefore I build tall. In China, in many situations, it's actually the opposite, where I'm the mayor of Shenyang, for example, and I want to make Shenyang the next Hong Kong or London. What do I do? I build tall buildings, create a landmark for my city, and hope that a bunch of companies show up and occupy them. That's a very strange motivation, isn't it? The idea that you're copying the form of a city and hoping that its success will rub off on you. It's very much a build it and they will come model. In particular, you can see this in Shanghai's Pudong district. Pudong, once a flat expanse of warehouses and rice paddies, now has one of the most dramatic agglomerations of skyscrapers in the world. It has three super tall towers, including the Shanghai Tower, which is the world's second tallest building, which will be completed this summer. The interesting thing about a skyline is that you can't really see it properly from it within the city. It's a distant view of a place, isn't it? In Pudong and Shanghai, we see this dichotomy in a really awful way. The three super talls in Pudong are an extraordinary symbol of Chinese prosperity and ambition and growth. But they are best viewed from a distance. When you view these towers from up close, they are very cool, very detached from each other and from the city around them. They don't shape really any public activity. 
And in this sense, they're entirely different from the, the great example of the Empire State Building, which tears down beautifully and really embraces the street life of Manhattan in a way that these Chinese towers don't. Technological advances mean we can go higher and higher. And not just up. There are designs for lifts that go up and down, then left and right, backwards and forwards, even crossing sky bridges linking towers, lifting street life far above street level. So how high can we go? And how high should we go? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> there is a limit somewhere, that's for sure. Because there's a physical limit. There's a moment when you have to stop. It's the general consensus of engineers that we could go up to a mile high. Whether there would ever be an economic justification for doing so is questionable. Even going back to the 50s, Frank Lloyd Wright had proposed a tower for downtown Chicago called the Illinois, which was to have been a mile high. A mile high, that's 1.6 kilometers straight right. up. Now the Sears Tower, now Willis Tower here, is uh, 1454 feet uh, in the 400s of meters, so much smaller by comparison, but it takes up a square block. And one of the reasons that it does is because it has so many elevators. You know, you can't just have one set of elevators serving all the floors. You have to have express and local elevators uh, serving intermediate floors. So when they designed the Illinois, which was to be several times bigger than w what is now the Willis Tower, the base was so thick it took up several square blocks. You wouldn't want to lease that space if you were near the core, you would have no natural light. So elevators have been really the main inhibitor. Challenging the sky, defying gravity is fine. It's part of our human nature, I guess. But you have to be clever and you have to be wise, and I think there's a limit. I don't think we can try to build more and more and more and more high. It doesn't make any sense. There's a moment when nature will revenge, you know, and because the earth is, is, is not that easy. They will see us waving from such great heights. Come down now. There are dozens of different podcasts now available from the BBC, including news, documentaries, science, business, arts and sport. For details of them all, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts.